right? Oh, such an important question, John. Um, the first thing is to accept evolution and not be threatened by it. And I have sought time and again to, to insist that evolution is not a type or an or a alternative to creation. It really is an, it's a type of history. And fundamental to our Christian faith is that God works through history. Okay, I'm really excited to be here today. We have a wonderful guest on our channel today, Graham Finley. And I want to start with an introduction of him and the, the topic. So um, regular viewers will know that one thing I'm passionate about is uh, telling people that you can be a faithful Christian and also accept evolution. Uh, and I'm also uh, passionate about uh, trying to show that the evidence behind common descent is really strong. And we're going to tackle both those things today with the topic uh, of non-homologist end joining, which is a genetic line of evidence for uh, for evolution. And I have with me Graham Finley, who is a, I think, retired professor, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, in the biological sciences. And he's, he's written uh, at least two books, two that I have. There's this one here, Human Evolution, uh, which provides genetic lines of evidence for, for evolution, for common descent. And then uh, I think this one is more recent, Evolution Eschatology, which I'm halfway through at the moment and enjoying. And he has a, a third book that's almost uh, on, almost, uh, on, almost out uh, that, that he may want to mention. And I'll, have, I'll provide links to these below. Um, so Graham is also a Christian, and he also does some uh, preaching occasionally. Uh, so this is uh, this is just a wonderful uh, opportunity here, and I'll let Graham add add anything that I've I've missed uh, before we get right into uh, the the topic. Well, thank you so much, John. I'm very honoured um, to be sharing in your online community, and I hope I can uh, contribute something useful today. Thank you for um, presenting my books. I have a third one uh, called The Gospel According to Dawkins. Um, this is one in which I just strictly concentrate on what he says about Jesus in the New Testament. Mm. Because at the best, what he says is controversial and arguable. And at the worst, he's just way off mark. Mm. Um, and so I thought I would just try to focus on, on something other than evolution this time, but just to look as a scientist at the um, the evidence for our faith as it is anchored in Jesus. Right. Um, so I've been involved in teaching scientific pathology and in cancer research um, for, uh, for a lifetime. And it was actually through cancer research that I became interested in evolutionary genetics. Because as that first book indicates, uh, in cancer, you can know that all the zillions of cells which comprise one cancer are descended ultimately from one cell if they share the same mutations. Mm. And then I read um, that in an evolutionary context, multiple species can be shown to descend from one cell, one reproductive cell, if they share the same complex, unique mutations. And then when I read this, I thought, wow, I've just got to tell my fellow Christians uh, because evolution is true, and really, it is no challenge at all to our faith. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's um, let's get right into it. Uh, this topic is something I think most people have never heard of before. It's a little bit obscure. It's called non-homologous end joining, and I'll let you explain it. But it's uh, I, I guess it's basically when a, a, a random event like a radiation uh, photon breaks a DNA strand and the normal repairs don't work so well. So the cell panics and puts together a slap job that's sort of unique and it, it acts as a marker. But what 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 actually what is non-homologist end joining in a nutshell? Uh, and I'm gonna right. maybe bring up some slides here that may might might help us. And then oh, you thanks. might wanna you might wanna do you want to give some attribution or Oh, yes. Um, what will follow will come from Calabrisi et al. Um, in this paper, they present pretty much a, a full list of um, what we call human um, mitochondrial sequences, uh, which have got into DNA. So um, 
they are many of them, not all of them are non-homologous in joining, but they are all unique patches which have held broken bits of DNA together. So Calabrese is one of my sources. And there's another paper uh, from the Batzer lab, from Mark Batzer, who've done some amazing work uh, looking at scars from non-homologous end joining, which are also clear, unambiguous markers of colon descent. So Pace et al., here's another um, reference if you would ever like to look it up. And I do owe it to these guys uh, for the information which I have further developed in my own thinking and um, writing. Wonderful, wonderful. So, so, so what is yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the bottom line there, you see three circles which have a squiggle in it, which re represents a cell nucleus and the DNA. And on the left-hand side, you can see there's a flash in the DNA. It's broken. And when you think of it, it's an amazing thing. Every cell in our bodies has two meters of DNA. Chromosome one, our longest chromosome, um, is 16 centimeters long. That long, right? Can you see it? No. <laughs> that long. In other words, that's a single molecule, 16 centimeters long. Our smallest chromosome is chromosome 22, uh, which has 50 million base pairs, and that's three centimeters long. That's a single molecule, three centimeters long. It, it boggles the mind. I still wonder at it after 40 years as a cell biologist. And as John said, every time a photon goes through this and smashes it, um, the cell urgently has to repair it because a single break in a DNA molecule can be lethal. And there are a number of ways of repairing it. But as John says, one of the emergency ones is non-homologous end joining where any bit of DNA or RNA can be used to stick the broken bits together. And so the middle circle represents a red squiggle, which comes from the mitochondrion, which is a little organelle in the cytoplasm, which makes energy, it transforms energy into energy the cell can use. It's got its own baby chromosome, and fragments of that chromosome can be used to plug the break. And you see on the right-hand side, you've got a patch, a DNA with a, a bridge, um, which, is, uh, which repairs that broken bit. And now that's present continuously forever in the DNA. So if this occurs in a reproductive cell, it's inherited by the next generation. Wonderful. And so on and on. Wonderful. Now, are these patches, I mean, they're unique, right? I mean, if, if this, this repair job, get, if it happens twice in two separate locations, the two locations would have most probably different scars, different looking scars? Absolutely, absolutely, John. For what they're unique first in the first instance that um, wherever a photon comes through is probably going to be unique. Now there's three billion base pairs um, in, in one genome set. So we've got two sets, six billion base pairs. So the chances of a photon hitting the same spot, exactly the same spot, are pretty remote. Yes the chances of the same bit of mitochondrial DNA sealing the break are very remote. And also when non-homologous joining occurs, sometimes the broken frayed edges are pruned backwards. So that mm -hmm. adds another element of uniqueness, of specificity to any one break. And um, then often novel bits of DNA are just added in the end, they're called non-templated bases because they aren't actually read from existing DNA. So all of these things make for each sequence being unique. So if, yeah, you'll never see two, two same independently arising. Um, so you, so you have the, the added bits on the end, you have the pruning, you have the uh, location and the, yeah. the DNA itself. And, and that's something I missed. So the, the, the location, so... You know, yep. when, when radiation hits a, a DNA strand and breaks it, it, it's not searching for a particular place to break. It's it the radiation is. doesn't have a mind of its own. It's it's hitting a random spot. That's right. It, it, it has no respect of sequences. <laughs> yeah, great. So this um, this next slide is uh, sort of a schematic of, of, of what happens when an HEJ uh, happens in a, um, I guess this would be in a human, cell 
Yes, um, indeed. Yes, indeed. And so uh, maybe if you could explain a little bit about what's going on here in this uh, schematic that sort of shows pictorially right, what we've bit, been talking about. A little bit messy, isn't it? And it's also um, undergone some changes in processing, I'm afraid. So we are, where I've got that list of DNA sequences, they should all be um, strictly collinear, but we can... Okay. We, we don't have to worry about that. So if you look at the, at the second line from the top, you see the word human. So that's a little base, what is it? About a little se segment, about 30 bases long, uh, except for the dots in the middle, which indicate that there's lots of bases I'm not showing you. So that shows a bit of human DNA. And the bits highlighted in yellow are derived from the little mitochondrial chromosome. So the very top line shows the corresponding bit of mitochondrial DNA. And every little horizontal line I've, I've written in indicates that that mitochondrial DNA base is exactly represented in this insert into human nuclear DNA. So, so it is scar. a scar. Is that the scar? It's a scar. It's a bit of mitochondrial DNA. Um, and I'm just showing the edges where it's got into the human nuclear DNA. Now, if you look below, you see the corresponding bits of the sequence of a whole bunch of other primates. The first one is chimp. And you'll see that the chimp sequence is pretty much exactly the same, except we've shifted a bit, but never mind, you can ponder that. But where I've got the blue, um, the blue blocks, brackets, if you like, they just show the corresponding bits of um, normal chromosomal DNA on either side of the brain. And you see that human, chimp, bonobo, gorilla are exactly the same. So we are looking at precisely the same bit, equivalent bit of DNA in the human and chimp and bonobo and gorilla genomes, except the parts I've colored orange are missing in human. They're there in all those other primate species. And very similar, although they start to diverge the further you get away from our DNA. So by the time you get down to Tarsia at the bottom, which, which isn't even an anthropoid primate, um, it's a prosimian, um, you can still see that it's the same sequence, but it's now getting a little bit different from ours. That's divergence. Right. So that bit in orange has been deleted. Okay. That's what happens when the break occurs. That's been deleted. Um, and the chromosomal DNA has been supplemented, if you like, with a yellow bit. Great. So here we see a human-specific break. It's an event which separates us from all our other primate relatives. So it's a natural process which distinguishes our DNA from chimp and gorilla and orang-utan DNA, a right. single event which um, demonstrates how similar we are, and yet here is one event which separates us from them, one naturally occurring molecular process. Okay, so that's great. And so I think what we're going to go to next is shifting more to how is this uh, evidence for, for common descent and um, just to give a, and you actually, I think, uh, mentioned this a little bit in your uh, prologue, but uh, what is the general concept of how uh, this can be used for, for evidence of common descent? Is, is that what this, this slide might show? It does. And it also shows, it also, also illustrates the fact that mitochondrial DNA, insert, DNA inserts are still arising. So here is a single case of a human breast cancer. As I said, I got into this because I'm, I've been involved in cancer biology for 40 years. Um, and here we have a human breast cancer where a mitochondrial DNA insert was found. The top line of that little evolutionary tree represents blood cells, which are normal from this patient. But the primary breast cancer and a lymph node metastasis, a lymph node secondary cancer, both have the same mitochondrial DNA insert. 
So we know that this insert occurred during the process of cancer development. And because it's present in both the primary tumor in the breast and a secondary tumor in the lymph node, we know that those two tumors, those different sets of cancer cells, are descended from the same cell where this mitochondrial DNA insert occurred. So again, a shared mutation in cancer is evidence of monoclonality. And what we'll talk about in a minute is that a shared mutation in different species is evidence of, of species monophilicity, which mm -hmm. is descent from the same ancestor. So, so let's get to that now. And is it is it sort of the is the concept that if we find the same scars in the exact same places in the DNA of humans and chimps, then how could that have happened unless they had shared a common ancestor? Is that roughly? That's exactly right, John. There is no way, no, no way um, that's conceivable that these could occur independently. And now you showed me a, a case where here's a mitochondrial DNA insert, which is shared by humans, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orang-utans, all the great apes. Look to the left, that's the flanking genomic DNA. Look to the right, that's the flanking genomic DNA. They're highly similar. And now they all share the same insert, the same bit of mitochondrial DNA has been inserted. Below, we've got old world monkeys and new world monkeys, baboons, macaques, green monkeys are old world monkeys, marmosets, the night monkey, the squirrel monkey, the capuchin monkey are new world monkeys. So that goes back 30 million years or more. They have an undisturbed, uninterrupted sequence. That's pretty much what it was before the break. But the great apes, have this um, interruption of the same bit of mitochondrial DNA at the same site. And the, the conclusion, the ineluctable, ineluctable conclusion, is that it occurred in a reproductive cell from which all the great apes have since been uh, descended, been derived. Now, just one thing, that doesn't mean there was only one animal or one female alive at the time. But it does mean that over evolutionary time, all the other lineages from that population have died out. And so all the existing humans, chips, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans are descended from that one lineage in which this DNA breakage and repair event occurred. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's take a look at another one. This might be, uh, maybe that we can breeze past this one. I don't know if there's anything anything new or different to, that this this slide adds that the other one did not maybe this is this is not mitochondrial right this is uh, that's right this, this comes from the bats bats group and they've looked at a lot of situations where um, dna has been inserted not from the mitochondrion but from other sites and again, we're a little higgledy piggledy here, but the gray shaded box represents DNA from somewhere else on the same chromosome. So it's an insert, it's a patch. The area which I've boxed represent one, two, three, four, five, six as a non-templated DNA bases. They've just been thrown in in an emergency reaction. And mm -hmm. again, the gray brackets represent flanking DNA, which anchors us to the same point and all these other species. And the two bases which are um, shaded represent bases which are lost. Right. So we have lost two bases here. The same, all of these different chance events are common to the African great apes in mm. this case. So it's a more recent event than the previous one, which was the great apes, including the orangutan. Wonderful. All right, let's see what we got next for a slide here. It's, oh, okay. So this is... Um, this is, I, I might have skipped a slide. No, I, I think I'm good. So this is, um, does this speak to nested hierarchies or am I getting my concepts wrong? Um, I guess you could call it that. It really is just a dendrogram. It's a, it's a evolutionary tree of the primates. And up till now, we've only looked at single insertion events. 
But now if you add a lot of insertion events, each of which has a different age, you can use it to derive a phylogenetic tree of the primates in this case. So this comes from another very strong evolutionary um, genetics group, Noll et al. There's the reference. Uh, Jürgen Schmitz is the guy in charge of it. And they've developed a program, which is something that you as a computer person will understand, but I struggle with. But they can search multiple genomes, um, find where any particular mitochondrial DNA insert occurred, and um, using them to derive all the branch points of the primates. So on the left-hand side, they have found one uh, insertion, that number one in the red box, which is common to tarsiers and all the species above it, but not to lemurs and bush babies. Hmm. So that one insert demonstrates that tarsiers, monkeys, and the apes, including humans, are derived from the, an the same ancestor. The MOVE box shows seven independent inserts. And that is not found in Tarsia, Lemur, or Bush Baby, but it is found in Marmoset, Marmoset and all the other species above. So that occurred in a simian ancestor. To hurry up, nine of them occurred in an old world primate ancestor, which includes old world monkeys and the apes. 12 of them in the great apes, six of them in the African great apes, one of them shares in occurred in a human and chimp ancestor, and there's a whole swag which is specific for human beings. So they've occurred subsequently um, to human separation from the chimp ancestor we have with chimps. So this establishes that the same process has been ongoing for tens of millions of years, right back at least to our ancestor with Tarsia. And it enables us to derive a family tree of the primates, which just happens to be congruent hmm. with many other markers, independent markers of primate evolution. Right. So this tree that we, we derived by using um, these scars, it's, it's, it's identical or, or close to the, the trees that's derived from using other independent lines of genetic evidence. Absolutely, um, or morphological evidence or whatever in this case. Yeah. So, yes, it's, a, it's one incredibly powerful line of evidence, which is congruent with independent, incredibly powerful lines of evidence. Right. All right, wonderful. So that's, that's the evidence. And one thing that, that interests me, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Uh, this is a neat-looking slide. Uh, do, do these scars ever provide um, sort of fabric for evolution to happen? Is, do they provide maybe um, opportunity for new mutations that can create new new function or, or is, is, is that not a thing? Yeah, uh, indeed they do, um, John. Now this diagram I, I have adapted and, and simplified from a very recent article in Nature. So you can see it's an evolutionary tree. But it's not an evolutionary tree of species. It's an evolutionary tree of a clone of B cells which make antibodies. So it's a single clone of B cells which has proliferated in response to the um, immunization with, um, in this case, a, a COVID protein. Now, it illustrates something which to me is absolutely wonderful. That in our DNA, we've only got three genes which encode for antibodies. But our immune systems can make an effectively infinite number of different antibody proteins. How can three genes encode for 10 to the 20 antibody proteins? The amazing marvel of the immune system is that every time a B cell develops into a potential antibody forming cell, a mutational process occurs in its antibody genes. That's mediated, rearrangements occur, and these are done by RAG proteins, which is another fascinating evolutionary story. But DNA breaks occur, and they are repaired by non-homologous 
and joining. So this occur process is happening every time a B cell develops in our bone marrow or our lymph nodes or our skin or our gut. Every time antibody cells are responding to a foreign protein or polysaccharide. Oh, so in our own bodies, non-homologous end joining is providing a mechanism to increase mutation frequency to generate novel antibody forming cells. And if that process didn't occur, we'd be immune deficient and we die of infections as babies. Wow. Okay. So the mutagenic role of non-homologous end joining in our bone marrows on a time scale of days is necessary for life. So there's a couple of things which arise from this. It shows the power of natural selection. I've had dear Christian friends and they say, oh, natural selection, chance, randomness, it's just not, it just doesn't have the right feel. But natural selection, randomness followed by selection is a powerful mechanism for exploring your environment, mm -hmm. both in the millions of years of genetic evolution and the days and weeks of antibody development. And secondly, people, especially of the Dawkins school, like to say randomness means no God. Randomness means no purpose. But here in our bone marrow is a mutational purpose, mechanism, which is life sustaining. Hmm. Randomness leads to life. Randomness leads to life. Randomness leads to development. Yeah. Wonderful. There is a cost, of course. Many antibody forming cells die. They don't make it. They, mm -hmm. they, they express things wrongly. And we must be aware that evolution has been achieved at a cost. Mm -hmm. There is suffering and sickness. Mm -hmm. And the, our only answer to that cost must be the gift of, of Jesus by God, mm -hmm. who has entered into human suffering to renew and to redeem and to save. Um, those of us who suffer, um, not only from the random effects of our sin, sin is randomness, it's just arbitrary disobedience, but also the random effects of, of DNA mutations. Mm. All right. So are there any potential counter examples here, any counter arguments? I don't, I mean, this, 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 your, your book and this, this topic was what convinced me, what put me over the hurdle uh, to accepting common descent. I, I couldn't see any legitimate counter arguments. Have you heard any or what, 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 or are there any legitimate counter arguments to this type of evidence? I'm not aware of any, John. I really can't conceive of any. Um, there is, I, I just getting ready for our conversation today. I looked up, Numites, a nuclear NUMTS, which is the abbreviation nuclear sequences and mito, nuclear mitochondrial sequences. Uh, and there's a paper in Nature where, uh, with the new screening technologies, people have looked at 66,000 human DNA sequences. And they found that there is an enormous number of low frequency mitochondrial sequences circulating in, in the human population. So this is a real phenomenon. You can't get round it. You can't say that we are all made by that, made with those in our DNA, because mm. each of us has one or two which are perhaps unique. And mm. in fact, they estimate that every 10,000 births, another mitochondrial DNA sequence is added to the human genome pool. So it is mm. a natural phenomenon. You can't say that God made us like it because it's still happening. Hmm. Um, the 900 or so I've just, which have been described by Calabrese, or 700 is it, um, these are fixed, so we all share them. Hmm. The, the ones in this recent nat nature paper, thousands, hundreds of them anyhow, uh, which they've identified at low frequency, these are unfixed, we call them polymorphic, because they might be present in you but not in me, and I've got a different set from my, my wife, and they've got a different set from person down the street. So this is a natural pr process. 
Mm. We don't need to postulate divine miracles when a natural process accounts for their origin and where the distinctiveness of each uh, illustrates their uniqueness. Mm. So given the strength of this evidence, how should the church respond? And this is very controversial in some quarters of the church. How, how, how do you wish that the church would, would respond and grow in, in light of this, this, uh, this evidence? Right. Oh, such an important question, John. Um, the first thing is to accept evolution and not be threatened by it. And I have sought time and again to, to insist that evolution is not a type or an or a alternative to creation. It really is an, it's a type of history. And fundamental to our Christian faith is that God works through history. Mm. The Old Testament is God's history in Israel. The New Testament is God's history as revealed in Jesus and the history of the church. Evolution is just God's history and all its randomness and all its messiness. Look at the messiness of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. Extinction, Samaria, 722 BC, Jerusalem, the horror of its annihilation in 587 BC. History is messy. And so biblical history just has the same pattern as evolutionary history. It's random, it's messy, but God still achieves his purposes. Mm -hmm. And from the messiness of Israel's history came the Savior. And St. Paul could look at that and says, Christ is a human being belongs to their race, even though his heart breaks over the sorrows which have been the sufferings of Israel. Mm -hmm. So God achieves his ends through history. The other thing I would like to urge my dear Christian brothers and sisters, those early chapters of Genesis are not there to tell us about the age of the universe. They're not there to tell us about evolution or, or how species breed true or anything like that. Those early chapters of Genesis take literary motifs of the ancient age, the ancient world, and they fill them with new content to illustrate the glory and distinctiveness of Israel's God. They take old stories. They are not a proto-science, but they take old stories to say, look at these stories, but our God is different. In other words, the writers of Israel were trying to point their readers to the glory of Israel's God, whom we know as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we are going to interpret those early chapters rightly, it is to ask this question, how should we 21st century Christians live for God in an increasingly pagan world? Mm. Got it. Wonderful. Um, Graham, thank you so much for sharing this time with me, for sharing uh, your wisdom and your learning with um, you know, my, my channel and my audience. And we're all blessed. Uh, we've been blessed to have you here. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, the discussion. I've been very privileged again, John. Thank you for inviting me. God bless you and your work. Thank you.